<laughs> sure I'm working now. Oh. Ooh. All right, good evening. Good evening. Good to be back. Had a good had a great time at the Bible conference. Got to meet some nice people and met a family from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Scarborough family down there. Murfreesboro is where the sword of the Lord is. And uh just nice people, said they've been watching us for quite some time and just how thankful they are for the ministry here out of this church and how much Bible they've learned. And they're, they're, one of their sons is now teaching some of this stuff to a, a group down there around Nashville. And so, man, it's just a blessing. Me and Marsha went out and knocked on some doors today and I got, got, got to learn something that I just absolutely shocked me. We knocked on this one door, and uh, the guy answered the door, no shirt on, all tatted up, and been in the pen 17 years. I asked him, said, uh, you saved? He said, yeah, I'm saved. Marshall said, how do you know you're saved? He said, Jesus Christ died for my sins. Had a, had a pretty clear testimony, had some doctrinal issues about eternal security and things of that nature. But he had a pretty clear testimony of salvation. Next door we knocked on was a guy been in the Methodist church for 30 years. And this was his exact words to us. I believe we were put here by aliens. <laughs> when I tell you folks that, half, that, the, that all these churches in Fairmont, West Virginia, ain't worth the time of day, I mean it. Amen. When you can go to the penitentiary for 17 years and learn more Bible than you can in 30 years in a Methodist church, there's issues going on. Amen. Yeah, right. Amen. Yeah. Romans chapter 7. <laughs> I never thought I'd see the day. You used, used to be able to go into Methodist church and at least hear the gospel. I guess, they, I guess they show up to church now and watch ancient aliens on the history channel or something. I don't know. Romans chapter 7. Uh, tonight we're going to try to look at this last section, the last part of the first section. This is the first section of the second cornerstone. And folks, I'm telling you, this, this doctrinal stuff we're, we're studying here in the book of Romans is, is absolutely just, just great stuff. I heard uh, one of Marshall's buddies down at the conference talking about Romans chapter 12 and how Paul tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and proving what is the good, perfect, acceptable will of God. But if you notice that, God doesn't, Paul doesn't bring you to the section about being transformed and proving the will of God until you first understand justification, this ministration of the grace of God, and dispensationalism. God doesn't want you trying to perform his will until you're a dispensationalist. Think about that. That's clear if you study Romans 9, 10, and 11. People who, who don't rightly divide the word of truth and are not dispensational in their understanding of the Bible, they're going to get the will of God mixed up today. And they're going to be trying to do things that God isn't doing today. Right? And so we've been looking at these four cornerstones. The first cornerstone was the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel of Christ. And this righteousness of God re, uh, revealed in the gospel of Christ, how that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again from the dead according to the scriptures, that, that righteousness of God revealed in that gospel results in the free justification of those who believe. Free justification. And in, any person who doesn't preach it as free justification is somebody who's either corrupting the righteousness of God or a man who's not yet seen the righteousness of God. Right? right? If you truly see the righteousness of God in the gospel of Christ, you cease from your own works and trust in the righteousness of God. Amen. You see that what, part, what took place that day on the cross of Calvary was so righteous and perfect that there's nothing you could do to ever equal that righteousness. Yeah, that's right. right? And so we as believers, what are we doing? If you look back in Romans 4 or 5 real quick, great verse in the book of Romans. There's our first foundation. 
I love that verse. That's the first cornerstone of our faith right there. To him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly. Right? You see, our faith is rooted and grounded in God who justifies the ungodly. Right? That's where my faith is. My faith is in not what I'm doing, what God requires me to do. My faith is in what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And through and by that, God justifies me through his own righteousness. Bill, I'm clothed with the righteousness of God. What a thing. Right? Now, if you notice here in Romans chapter 5, the second, as we come into Romans chapter 5, if you notice verse 1, he begins that verse with therefore. If you look in verse 12, he begins that verse with wherefore. This divides Romans 5 into two sections. Right? Right? Romans 5, 1 through 11 is Paul concluding everything he has said about justification up to this point. Down to verse 11. He's telling you what you have as a result of being justified. You have peace with God, access into this grace wherein we stand, hope of glory. Uh, We glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and all that. Then he comes down there and he says that we've received the atonement through Jesus Christ in verse 11. Right? We shall be saved from wrath through him and all this. But now beginning in verse 12, when you, when you read the word wherefore in the Bible, therefore is him taking you backwards and concluding on what he said. Wherefore is taking everything he said and then leading in a new direction with it. So beginning in verse 12, Paul's going to take now this, this righteousness of God and show you how that through righteousness... He, the, God, the grace of God now reigns how? Look at verse 521. How does God's righteousness now reign? Through what? Righteousness. Right. right? That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through what? Righteousness unto eternal life. Amen. Well, whose righteousness is God's grace reigning through? It ain't yours. Right. It's through the righteousness of one man, Jesus Christ. Amen. And God's grace through the righteousness of that one man now reigns unto eternal life, right? And so, and so we started this section now about the grace of God. And what the grace of God is, is it's the ministration through righteousness unto life. In other words, if you are living under the grace of God, the effects of Adam's disobedience, there should be, there should be a transformation away from those things. Right? The sin and death that worked in us as a result of Adam's transgression, the righteousness and life of Jesus Christ shall now be working in in them who believe and are under the grace of God. Right? I tell people all the time, man, these people just want to make everything positional in the Bible. Did Adam just give you positional sin and death? Think about it now. Adam's disobedience gave you real sin and death working in you. The obedience of Jesus Christ under the grace program should be giving you real righteousness in life. And if you've believed and are justified and righteousness in life is not increasing and working in you, it's because you haven't, you're not living under grace. Right? Right. Right? Look at Romans 6, 14. What shouldn't have dominion over you? Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? You're not under the what? But under what? Grace. So if sin has dominion, if you're like Paul in Romans chapter 7, oh wretched man that I am, if that's your experience as a Christian, you're not living under grace. It's that simple. Right? The experience of a believer under grace is life, not death. Who shall deliver me from the body of this what? Death. And then he comes into chapter 8. We always want to stop in Romans 7 and just act like, well, that's going to be our Christian experience. But he comes into Romans chapter 8 and he talks about those who walk after the Spirit and he says, for the law of the Spirit of what? Life hath made me free from the law of sin and what? And we're going to see what that law of sin and death is. It's not physical death. Paul just said it back in Romans 7, 25, the body of this death. You see, there's a law of sin, and it's that sin 
That brings you into a state of death. And what that death is, is because of the activity of sin in the flesh, you're not able to perform what the good that you're supposed to perform because of the activity of sin. And therefore we're dead because we have no ability to perform. But, but we, we are given the ability to, to perform by the Spirit. The Spirit quickens us. To quicken means to bring to motion, to bring active. We talk about quicksand, right? What is quicksand? It's active sand. It's moving. It's, 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 it's almost like it's alive, right? right? And, so, and so when we talk about being quickened by the Spirit, the Spirit gives our, our body the ability to perform, right. right? And so we've been looking at this now. The first section in Romans, this section about the grace of God is Adam and Jesus Christ. Right? That's Romans 5, 12 through 21. We've already looked at this. We ain't going to spend no time there. But you have Adam's disobedience. Adam's disobedience made you somebody. Right? What did it make you? Made you a sinner. Amen? That's your, that was your identity when you were born. Amen. David understood that. Psalm 51. In sin did my mother conceive me, yea, I was shaping in iniquity. Right? You, your identity when you were born was a sinner. And because you were born a sinner, you were under condemnation. Right? Yep. What was God's judgment and condemnation upon Adam's transgression? It was death. Yep. Right? But now Paul talks about the obedience of one man. Christ's obedience. Well, what was his obedience? His obedience was unto death. You see that right there? Christ died. Amen? Christ died and I, my old man is condemned at the cross. When that Bible said he was raised, again, for our justification, what he means is, is Christ took our condemnation at the cross and then he rose from the dead so that we could be justified by his life. Amen. My justification is now in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so you take Christ's obedience here. Well, through the obedience of that man, what did, what, what did he make you? He made you righteous. Amen, that's a free gift of God. You see that condemnation? Through his obedience came justification. And what is that justification? It's life. He calls it that there in Romans 5. Uh, uh, Romans, it's here. Yeah, Romans 5, 18. Last, last three words in the text. Justification of what? Life. Of life. Right? Condemnation of death, justification of life. And now, Romans, that, that first section there, Romans 5, 12 through 21, ends by talking about two administrations. And folks, I, I want this, this, this right here is so important for Christians to get. There are so many saved people who don't know how to live. That's right. The issues we're talking about is not going to heaven. Forgiveness of sins. These issues are how do we live? Right? How do I now live? The grace of God through righteousness unto what? Eternal life. This death that was in us all because of one man's disobedience, we now through the obedience of Christ have been made righteous and justified unto life. Paul talks about reigning in life by one man, Jesus Christ our Lord. But how do we live? Well, you got two administrations here. You know how many Christians, fundamental Baptists are the worst for it. You know how many, you know how many Christians are trying to live under the wrong administration? Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Because Paul's going to quote, he's going to, when he comes into Romans chapter 7. He's going to talk about serving in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. You see, this life is ministered not by the letter. This life is ministered by the spirit. And as, as the spirit ministers this life to our spirit, 
or, or inner man, our spirit is regenerated and renewed unto life and therefore we walk in that newness of life and have no need of the law. Amen. If you're led of the spirit, ye are not under the what, Marshall? The law. Amen. If you're led of the Spirit, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the what? Sons of God. Amen. Now, look at 2 Corinthians 3, 5, 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Right? Paul said our sufficiency is of God. Bill, I wouldn't know the first thing about ministering life to mankind. Our sufficiency is of God. Right? You got so many preachers that think all you got to do is just get up and keep knocking people over the head, taking the rod of Moses and just beating them. Get them up to this altar and get them confessing and repenting. And it's a lifetime of death. They're ministering death. Right? He says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. You see, Paul's going to talk about this in Romans 7. The woman which hath the husband and all that. For the letter what? Killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Look at verse 7. But if the ministration of what? Death. Written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of what? Condemnation. Condemnation. Here it is. Be glorious. Much more doth the ministration of what? Righteousness. There it is. These things are oil and water. They're so different you couldn't get them confused. Yep. One will kill you. One will give you life. One will condemn you. One will give you righteousness. One is of the letter, the other one is of the spirit, yes. right? right? And here, here's, here's, what I, here's, here's the way I explain it to people. If 20 years in formal religion has done nothing in regenerating your inner man, somebody's not ministering the New Testament to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's that simple, right? right? And so these two administrations, only one administration, listen, Righteousness in life is not something that results from the vile uh, activity of our flesh. Righteousness unto life is a complete total operation and work of the grace of God. Amen. Amen. It's not something we perform. Amen. Now, come back, Romans chapter 6. Now this, this, this section here, we're not, we haven't got into it yet. I'm covering the last section tonight on this first cornerstone, and then we're going to move into the next section. This first section is all about positional identity. You see that? That's two men. That's who you were in Adam. This is who you are in Jesus Christ. And those are the two administrations. If you're in Christ, that's your administration right there, the administration of the grace of God. Right? And so now we're going to get into the experiential identity that Paul's going to talk about Romans 7 and 8. But the second second part of this first section, he talks about our identity by baptism. By baptism by the Spirit. Now this is all positional. Now he's going to come into chapter 8 and talk about experiential identity by walking after the Spirit. Right? The Spirit of God took you and identified you into the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That Now we talked about this the last, last week we taught on this stuff. It's sad. It's absolutely sad that so many Christians have heard the word baptism. Right? Counter, you know, Satan loves to use our words. He loves to counterfeit our words. Don't he preach another Jesus? Right? Another gospel. Right? He didn't come down and deny, you know, everything God said when he came to Eve. Right? 
Right. Satan, Satan will give you 95% truth and then sneak leaven in there and corrupt the whole thing. Right? If you, you, listen, if you can get a man, Christ said, beware of the leaven of who? The Pharisees. And he spoke of their doctrine. He said, beware of the leaven of the Herodians. And he spoke of their doctrine. Paul said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You get messed up in one point, and that thing will permeate in the mind and get the whole mind messed up in every other point. I've seen it happen time and time again with people. Right? right? Doctrinal purity is important. You want to know how important it is? Look over in Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of what? Doctrine. Doctrine. Now listen. The only way you're going to be freed from sin to become servants of righteousness is there's a form of doctrine you have to obey from the heart. You can't just get the bad doctrine and then wonder why it ain't working. The form of doctrine, Paul's giving it to you here in Romans 6. My baptism into Christ baptized me, number one, into his death. Look at what he says there. Now, before we start looking at this section, I want you to notice a good thing for you to study. We ain't going to get into it. A good thing for you to study is to notice that Romans 6 and 7 is divided into Three sections. By the phrase, know you not. Romans 6, 3, know you not. Romans 6, 16, know you not. Romans 7, 1, know you not. And if you'll understand those three sections there, the first section is about our baptism in, into Jesus Christ. The second section is about being a servant of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But there's something you have to obey. You have to obey the form of doctrine. Right? Yep. And then the second, the third section, know you not, is about the dominion of the law. What I want you to focus on is number one, you were baptized into his death. What does that mean? Well, it means you have a complete new relationship to sin. Right? right. And, and when I hear people say, this is, this is what I have to understand, this is what I, I've come to understand through the doctrine. When you hear people say, I just can't live it. I just, I'm just a vile wretch. That's somebody who's never heard and understood this doctrine. Amen. Yeah. Right. Right? right? This whole section here is about knowing some things. Oh, yeah. It's not about you doing anything. It's about knowing. Know ye not, verse 6, knowing this, verse 9, knowing that. Verse 11, what's he say? Likewise, reckon. Until we take that doctrine and, and, and believe it in our heart and then reckon it to be so. Right. Listen, God's word said I'm dead to sin and I'm alive unto him. I believe it and I reckon it to be so. Amen. Yeah. Right? As long as we still think that we're alive unto sin and dead to righteousness, we'll never live unto righteousness. Right? What does Paul say in Romans 6, 2? God forbid, how shall we that are what? Dead to sin, live any longer therein. What do you mean we're dead to sin, Paul? Well, he explains it. Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death? Therefore, we are. Buried with him by baptism into death. You see that? You know what this means? I'm dead to sin. I'm freed from sin. Look at Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Paul Lucas, the moment I got saved, Paul Lucas was dead 2,000 years ago. Crucified with Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Right? That old man has been condemned, Bill. Put to death. Right? I'm now dead to who I was. My life now is the life that was buried and rose again from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. That's the life that I now have. This is now, listen, we're not getting into how you actually walk in it or experience it yet. This is just the cold, hard facts of the doctrine. Right? Look there in. Uh, Romans 6, 6, 7. He that is dead is freed from what? 
Okay, God, I believe you. Amen. Right? You're going to have to first believe him. Right? Until you're ever going, listen, we're talking about positional identity. The experiential stuff's coming next in Romans 7 and 8. But you're never going to get the experience until you understand the identity. Here's Christ here. This is what his work done. That's the administration for those. And now Paul's taking you and showing you that this man's obedience, you've been baptized into it. Amen. Right? You are now righteous through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. You are dead to sin, freed from sin. You're no longer under the law and therefore sin shall not have dominion over you. You are under grace. So what is grace? It is freedom from, it's not, it's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin to serve righteousness. That's what true grace is, right? Now, number two here, his death. We already looked at this. That's why I'm going through it pretty quick. Now you have his resurrection, Right? You see, his death is not what gives, his, his, his death is what put my old man to death. And I'm thankful for the death of Christ because that's my forgiveness of sins. But it's his life that, that now gives me life. The resurrection is just as much a part of the gospel of Christ as his death and burial. Look there in Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into what? Death. Watch this. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. Newness of life. You know what that means? Life comes from the work and power of God, not from our activity of our flesh. You can sit and try until the cows come home. When they placed Jesus Christ in the ground, that body was inactive. It was the glory and power of our God that raised him from the dead. And you, by baptism, have been baptized into his death and buried with him so that the same power of God that raised him from the dead can work in you to give you newness of life to walk in. It is 100% an activity and work of God. For a Christian to walk in newness of life. Nothing more. You say, where do, we, where, do we, where do we find this power? Where do we find this? By grace are ye saved through what? Faith. Faith. This is why we harp on religion, man. Right? You can, you, you can trace, you can trace uh, Keith Blades talks about this. You can trace the vain religious system of man from today, from that harlot, Revelation 17, all the way back to Cain in, in Genesis chapter 4 who slew Abel. Vain religion. It means nothing. What was Israel's problem? Their whole, their whole existence, they took the truth of God and turned it into a vain religious system. Amen? Resurrection, what is it? So that I can live. And so verse 11, we're talking about, listen, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Well, what is, what is this? Look in Romans 6, 10. There's the likeness of his death and resurrection. In that he died, he died unto what? How many times? <laughs> But in that he liveth, he liveth unto who? God. He liveth. Notice that's, that, that's a continual word there. Right. Dead, he died unto sin once, past tense, in that he liveth, how long does he live? Forever. He liveth unto what? God. God. You, see, you see these two opposites there? You can't live unto God until you're dead to sin. A man that lives unto sin cannot live unto God. So that's the dilemma, isn't it? Right? So how, how do I now, listen, this is why Paul says, I was alive without the law once when the commandment came, sin revived and I what? Died. Right? And so for a man to live unto God, he must first be dead unto sin. Now we are positionally, right. 
But how is this going to become a reality in our experience? Last section here, and then we'll, we'll pick up with the, with the experiential next week. Section C. Now, folks, y'all remember how that first cornerstone we did, how those two sections just worked perfectly together? How that Israel's uncircumcision was made uncircumcision by the law, but through faith, uncircumcision will be made circumcision and all this stuff. You're going to see that same stuff here. These two sections Paul lays out, they, they work perfectly together. Okay? The last section here is about our identity, our new identity in Christ, and deliverance from the law. Deliverance from the law. Now this is going to coincide with an experience one day. You see, this is all positional. Right? right. My old man is dead. My first husband has been, is dead now. Yeah. Is that positional or, or, or experiential? It's positional. Right. right? This is all experiential stuff here or positional stuff. One of these days, we're going to get the experience of this old man being put off, this body of flesh and getting a new body, yep. Yep. a spiritual body in the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what you have to understand at this present time is that through his death, we now, listen, Paul doesn't just come here. He doesn't just, he's not been talking about all this stuff and then come into Romans 7 and say, let me give you three verses on marriage and divorce. So that the sword of the Lord preachers can boast and try to keep other men out of the ministry. Right? right, right. It's one of the passages they use. The sword of the Lord men are too stupid to see what Paul's even talking about there. Right. It's reality. Right? Oh, yeah. What's he talking about? He's talking about a woman that has a husband. Right? Mm -hmm. What about her? Well, as long as her husband lives... She's bound by the law to who? Her husband. Her husband. What, she, is she bound to righteousness? Is she bound to the law? No, she's bound to her husband. Yep. That's important for you to get. Paul's giving an illustration here. He's using the, hus the woman with the husband to illustrate that only death, only death could free you from sin by meeting the requirements of the law. That woman could not be freed from her husband until that husband was dead. You're in bondage to sin. The only way that you could be freed from sin is for the requirements of the law to be met. What was it? Death. You understand? Yep. Paul's using this to make an illustration. Remember what he said? I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might what? Live unto God. Right? All right, look here at Romans 7, 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become what? Dead. To the law by the body of Christ. Now, what Paul's doing here, remember this. I'm going to have to erase this, folks. It'll be on, it'll be on the video. What Paul's doing here, this is the analogy you got to get. He's talking about a woman that has a husband. And she says, he says there, that that woman who has a husband is bound by the law, bound by the law to who? Her husband. Right? The only thing that can break this bond here is for that husband to be dead. Right. So there's two people in the analogy, right? A woman and a husband. Mm -hmm. Now look what he says in Romans 7, 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. You know what that means? There's a part of you that's like that husband right there. Right. Just like that husband in the analogy was dead and that woman was loosed, you also are become dead. Now look, look at the second part. Right? He says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should what? Be married to another. Be married to another. So you're, there's a part of you like that woman. 
Do you see that you're both? Right? This woman is bound by the law to her husband until he be dead, and then she's loosed and free to be married to another. Will you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another? The, the, the analogy is clear. Well, what's Paul talking about? What's the woman? It's our inner man. The husband is the outer man. Right? The law bound the inner man to that outer man. Look, look at what he says. I'm, I'm going to prove it. Romans 7, 5, for when we were in the what? Flesh. Okay. When we were in the flesh. When this man here was in this man. Right. When your inner man was still in the fleshly man, in Adam. This person is not in Christ. This, this inner man is not in the flesh anymore. Paul said, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Okay? It gets deep, don't it? <laughs> but this is our God. Right? Okay, Romans 7, 5. Look at Romans 7, 15. This will help you understand this stuff. For that which I do, I allow not. You see that? What's Paul talking about there? He's talking about these two, these two things here. That which I do, this outer man, I allow not. That inner man, I allow not. You see that? You believe that's what Paul's talking about? I know it is. Look down in Romans 7, 21. I find then what? That when I... Would do good. Evil is what? Present. Present with me. So there's another law. There's another law that Paul now discovered. He says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another what? Law warring in my members against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Right. So we're talking about an inner man and an outer man. Well, here's what we have to understand. Paul is talking, when he's talking about that which I do, I allow not, he's talking about trying to serve righteousness through this oldness of the letter, yeah. through the program of the law. Amen. We'll get to all that because that's going to, all that's ever going to do is bring the experience of death. And what the experience of death is, is you never find the ability to perform. Because your body's dead. Why is it dead? Sin. Guess who's alive? Jesus Christ. Right? And through His death, that old man's now dead so that you can be married to another. And that union to that man is by one spirit. That There's a whole other law in the body of Christ that's contrary to the law of sin in my body. Remember when Paul says the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh? Right? Now, well, we'll get, I'm getting a little ahead of myself getting into the experiential stuff, but I want you to get this, okay? My inner man, my outer man, the moment I got saved, right? The, the moment I got saved, this woman over here, this law bound her to this man's law, his law. The moment that man died, she was freed. She was no longer bound to this man here. And now she was free to go be married to another man. Well, Paul says, ye also, my brethren, are become dead. This outer man, this, this, sin, this fleshly man, Adam, and his law, the law of sin and death, has been crucified with Christ, and I'm now free to be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here. Him that is what? Raised 
from the dead, right? In my old relationship to the flesh, I brought forth fruit unto death. But now I'm married to him that is raised from the dead that I should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. Okay, now look in Romans 7, 6. We're getting ready to close here. Romans 7, 6. And we'll, we're going to get into the experiential stuff next week and this stuff's good. Because remember, remember, these two administrations, folks, are going to follow you consistently throughout these chapters. That's the important thing to get. Yeah, it's great to know who you are in Christ. But it's even greater to know how the righteousness and life of Christ works effectually in us by grace. These two administrations, man, the law entered that sin might abound. But grace came through righteousness. Grace now reigns through righteousness unto eternal life. Now we're getting ready to see these two administrations again, and you're going to see them again in Romans chapter 8. There's a twofold work of the Spirit of God today. You know what the twofold work of the Spirit of God is? Listen, here's what the law does today sin is dead, isn't it? Through the cross of Christ. Oh, yeah. But you know what you do when you put yourself back under the law? The law is going to bring sin back to life, it's going to revive it. Right? So putting yourself, listen, is Christ the minister of sin? No. God forbid. But when you put yourself under the law, Paul said, sin revived and I died. I was now put back in this walking in this state where I could not perform and bring forth fruit unto God. I was dead. That's what we call functional death. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, if the spirit, he tells you Romans 8, 10, He says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your what? Mortal bodies. So right now, I have this this body over here. This body is now dead. What does that mean? It's dead because of sin. What does that death mean? It means that I'm dead to God. I cannot serve righteousness because my body is dead because of sin. But this spirit right here is life because of righteousness. And if this spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken what? Your mortal body. This activity of the Spirit is able to quicken and give life to that body to perform the righteousness that God wants us to perform. Right? So these two administrations are important. What is the job of this Spirit? It's to bring the deeds of this body to death that we can what? Live. Until the Spirit of God is able to bring to death the deeds of the body, you cannot live. All right? Now, Romans 7, 6, and I'm done. So you got these two administrations. Back in Romans chapter 5, the law entered that sin might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, now you come into the end of Romans chapter 7, right? We've been baptized into the death of Christ, buried with him by baptism, that we, that as he was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now Paul's going to close out this positional, this positional section. He showed you Adam and Christ and the two administrations He showed you your positional identity by baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ. Now he's getting ready to show you your administration. Romans 7, 6. What a a verse. Tucked away there neatly in our King James Bible. Probably ain't quoted three times a year in America. Right. Right? But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that's that old man, that we should serve. 
Who was you bound to before he died? The flesh. Who are you bound to now? Him that is raised from the dead. How do you serve in this new relationship? Not in oldness of the letter, but in newness of the spirit. What does that mean? If you notice that spirit is a little s. You cannot serve until the big spirit. <laughs> That's what I'm going to start calling him, you know. The big spirit, till the spirit of God. There has to be activity of this quickening spirit. The first man was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And by my union to Jesus Christ, the spirit that's in Christ now quickens my spirit. Right. How's he do it? By the renewing of the mind through the work of faith through the administration of grace. Amen. The grace of God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ now operates in me through faith unto what? Eternal life. And there's its operation right there. It's not coming to an altar. It's not taking your flesh and telling God you're going to do better with it. God knows what that flesh is. That's why he nailed it to a cross. It's no good. The only way we can, we can serve God is through this newness of spirit. Remember that newness of life back there? How do we walk in that newness of life? We first have to have this newness of spirit. This is the resurrection of Christ in the life of the believer. That spirit that raised him from the dead, quickening, quickening us, regenerating us, and giving us a newness of spirit inwardly. Amen. Amen. We don't serve in oldness of the letter. Now the reason that's important is if you look there beginning in verse 7, this is where the new section begins. What does Paul say in verse 7? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Paul doesn't want you thinking that about the law of God. The law of God was good, holy, and just. Amen. Sin was in the flesh. The problem was, is, is, is the law required obedience of that old man? The inward man could sit and say, I want to do good. I want to do good all I want to. But that, that inner man was bound to the outward man. Right. Yeah. right? The weakness of the law was in the flesh. Not in God's law. Paul said, is, is God's law sin? God forbid. But God gave the law for a specific reason. He gave the law to identify sin in you. Amen. Paul said, I had not known sin but by the law. So why did God give the law? He gave the law to identify sin. Right. Paul learned it. I find then. Yeah. Right? I find then a law. Paul realized it. The reason I can't do what I want to do is because there's a law of sin in my flesh and it was identified by the law of God. Right. Yeah. And then what did the law do at that point? It put him to death. Mm -hmm. Right? And the reason this is important is because what Paul's doing is he takes the oldness of the letter and the newness of the spirit. That's how the positional section closes. And now he's going to take you into two sections in Romans 7 and 8 where he's going to show you the oldness of the letter and the newness of the Spirit. And the two experiences that result from it. Oldness of the letter brings you to death. Look how many times Paul uses the word die and dead in Romans chapter 7. Then look how many times he uses life and quicken and life in Romans chapter 8. Right? And the reason this is important, folks, this is going somewhere. You got a positional identity in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's wonderful. Right? By the baptism of the Spirit, you've been baptized into His death, burial, and resurrection. Why is the experiential part so important? Why is it so important that I learn to walk in newness of life, serve in newness of spirit? Why is Romans 7 and 8 so important? Because just like you got that positional identity by the baptism of the Spirit of God, those who walk after the Spirit are going to get an experiential identity with Christ one day. As sons, joint heirs, and glorified together with Him. Amen. That's how Romans 8 ends. Mm -hmm. Right? If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For as many as are led 
not baptized, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. What do sons get? They get an inheritance. They get glory, right? The experiential part is important because if we experience the life and righteousness of Jesus Christ through walking after the Spirit, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. Any questions on any of that stuff? <laughs> Any confusion on any of this stuff? Uh, <laughs> Folks, I know, I know some of that stuff can get deep, but basically, really, it's, it's really this simple. You don't know it, you don't realize it, but the doctrine of God being preached in this church and, and uh, other doctrine that you may hear, God, through His doctrine, and through the work of faith is building us up unto godliness. Right. You, I mean, you folks already understand the majority of stuff. I, I went deep into it, got some strong meat out of it. But, but basically, man, the word of God and, and the work of faith will produce more godliness and righteousness than, than 10,000 years in a vain religion. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Just sit there and take in the word of God and the work of faith and quit worrying about the good works. The good works will come as God does his work in you. We are his workmanship created in Christ under good works. Man doesn't know how to perform good works until God does his work. Amen. And so it's, it's a simple work of faith done by the grace of God as, as the word of God is ministered. And so we have a New Testament, right? They're both written in this book, right? The oldness of the letter back there in the Old Testament worked death. The things we're preaching today out of Romans and things of that nature is working life in the believer. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray. And uh, I was going, going to tell you, I know some of you like to want to get home and it's past Gary's bedtime, but we <laughs> he's got to get some beauty sleep, brother. But we, Shinola does have some cake and ice cream for sending them out. We're going to have some cake and ice cream. Everybody's welcome to stay if they want to. I under, if you want to go home, I understand that too. We just figured we'd invite everybody since uh, Shinola didn't let any of y'all have any of that other cake. You know. <laughs> as little as little and Doris is roast, wasn't it, Gary? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for the precious blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the great redemption and justification that we now have in him. Lord, we thank you for the great, for the great power of his resurrection, Lord. And I just pray that you would help us to know and, to, and to, to experience that power of his resurrection each and every day. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to the great prize that is before us, the prize of winning Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord, just help us to press toward and to press onward, Father, and reach forth unto those things that you've set before us that are now in your Son. And God, I just ask that you'd keep everybody safe. Uh, be with Marshall's family. We thank you for the time we spent with them. And we just pray that you would keep them safe on their way back to Missouri, Lord. And we, uh, we just ask all these things in Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen.